And the psychoanalysts, I think, err too much on the side of the subject. They, they tend to think that too much of you is inside of you, and too little of you is outside of you. And part of the reason I believe that is because of my clinical experience. I love the psychoanalysts, man. They're brilliant. They're brilliant. They're deep. They grapple with real problems, like with the problems. When people have real problems, and I mean profound problems, they're really m profound moral problems. They're problems of good and evil, really. You know, there are things going on in their family that are so terrible that, well, that they're, they're sometimes fatal. You know, lie upon lie upon lie upon lie for decades and decades and decades. It's awful. And that's not exactly inside them. It's out there in the world. And lots of the people that I see, very famous critic of psychology, I can't remember his name, but I probably will, cr criticized the practice of psychology quite effectively in the, I believe in the early 60s. The Myth of Mental Illness by Thomas Saz, S Z A S Z. It's a classic. You should read it. If you're interested in psychology, read it. Like, it's, it's a classic. And he basically said, most people have problems in living, they don't have psychological problems. And so I've experienced, despite my love for the psychoanalysts, very frequently what I'm doing as a therapist is helping people have a life that would work. You know, and you can parameterize that. It's like, what do you need? How about some friends? That people kind of like that. How about an intimate relationship with someone that you can trust that maybe has a future? That'd be good. How about a career that puts you in a dominance hierarchy somewhere, so at least you've got some possibility of rising, some possibility of stabilizing yourself, and a schedule and a routine because no one can live without a routine. You just forget that. If you guys don't have a routine, I would recommend like you get one going because. You cannot be mentally healthy without a routine. You need to pick a time to get up. Whatever time you want, but pick one and stick to it, because otherwise you dysregulate your circadian rhythms and they regulate your mood. And eat something in the morning. I've had lots of clients who've had anxiety disorders. I had one client who was literally starving. Very smart girl. She, there was very little that she liked. She kind of tried to subsist on like half a cup of rice a day. She came to me and said, I have no energy. I come home, all I want to do is watch the same movie over and over. What, like, is that weird? And, and I thought, well, it depends on how hard you work. You know, it's a little weird, but whatever. It's familiar, you're looking for comfort. So I did an analysis of her diet. It's like three quarters of a cup of rice. It's like, you're starving. Eat something. You know, you'll feel better. So. She modified her diet and all her anxiety went away and she had some energy. It's like, yeah, you got to eat. <laughs> so, a schedule, that's a good thing, man. Your brain will thank you for it. It will stabilize your nervous system. With a bit of a plan, that's a good thing. You need a career, you need something productive to do with your time. You need to regulate your use of drugs and alcohol. Most particularly alcohol, because that does in a lot of people. Um, you need a family, like the family you have, your parents and all that. It'd be nice if you all got along, you could work on that. That's a good thing to work on. And then, you know, you probably need children at some point. And that's life. That's what life is. And if you're missing, you know, you may have a good reason to not be operating on one of those dimensions. It's not mandatory. But I can tell you that if you're not operating reasonably well on four, I think I mentioned six, if you're not operating reasonably well on at least three of them, there's no way you're going to be psychologically thriving. And that's more pragmatic in some sense than psychological, right? Human beings have a nature, there's things we need. And if we have them, well, that's good. And if we don't have them, well, then we feel the lack. And so behaviorists, Behavioral psychologists concentrate a lot more on that sort of thing. You know, it's practical. It's like strategizing. 
Make a career plan. Figure out how to negotiate, because that's bloody important. Figure out how to say what you need. Figure out how to tell the truth to people. Figure out how to listen to your partner in particular, because if you listen to them, they will actually tell you what they want. And sometimes you can give it to them, and maybe they'll return the favor. And if you practice that for like 15 years, well, then maybe you're constantly giving each other what you want. Well, hooray, that would be good. And then there's two of you, under most circumstances, and it's better to have two brains than one. Because people think differently because of their temperament, mostly. And so, the negotiation is where the wisdom arises. And it's part of the transformation, the psychological transformation that's attendant on an intimate relationship. And one of the fundamental purposes of a long-term intimate relationship.